In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Matthew 5, verse 16. Good morning, church. Good morning, Sudbury. And as Sean has already mentioned, it is truly a good morning. And indeed, that glory of God is all around us with that sunshine and the magnificence of his creation. And as our gardens are now budding, and also those black flies are budding as well, we very much know we're in Northern Ontario, which I suggest is God's country. On my way over, Sean, I was thinking something I've shared with the church family on different Sunday mornings, but I think these inspirational ones, it definitely calls to be recalled. And that's this. My question to you this morning is that when you got out of bed this morning, did you bounce out of bed, race to the window, throw open the drapes, and with a big smile on your face say, Good morning, Lord? Or did you crawl out of bed, stagger to the washroom, peer in the mirror, and say, Good Lord, is it morning? <laughs> it's all about attitude. And so therefore today, I hope that you are embracing that goodness of God's glory. This is kind of a two-part sermons, and I do appreciate Sean giving me the invitation to share in the ministry of the church. And as always, Sarah, we very much appreciate your gift in music and ministry. And a little bit later on, Pastor Mike is going to share perhaps with the most important part of our services, and that's when we commune with Jesus. Uh, but the two parts, this Sunday I'm going to talk about enlightened evangelism and we're going to talk about what that word means but don't miss next Sunday because I'm going to preach about what happens when that evangelism doesn't work and Jesus was pretty articulate about that with his disciples when he sent them on their mission but today I'm going to challenge you encourage you and perhaps even plead with you uh, to be a good evangelist uh, for this church for this community and certainly for God Jesus and the Holy Comforter let's pray O oh Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There is a story about an Air Force pilot during World War II whose plane was hit by artillery and he had to parachute out of his plane over a very obscure island in the Pacific Ocean. All he knew about the island is that perhaps it was inhabited by cannibals, but there was not only the possibility of cannibals, there might have been enemy soldiers that had infiltrated that island, so he could be captured, or he could have become the entree for the evening meal. As he lands in the dense jungle, he cautiously starts moving around, and he sees a column of smoke, and he thinks somebody must be here. Uh, so very quietly and carefully, he goes through the thicket of that jungle, but it was a very thick thicket, and he couldn't see anything. But when he was close enough, he heard a voice shout, Who the blankety-blank-blank trumped my blankety-blank ace? With that, he fell to his knees, his hands in the air, tears gushing from his eyes, and said, Thank goodness I'm among Christians. <laughs> Even with 10 people or nine, if you count me, I'm glad you all smiled and kind of encouraged that story because that's what it's all about. My question to you this morning is what constitutes our identity as Christians? What are the essential ingredients to our being disciples of Christ? Those are the, with piety of language and dress sometimes view themselves as evangelical envoys of the church. But I ask you this morning if those outward and visible signs are reliable indications to a spiritual grace inside each of us. After all, the media evangelists who have been convicted of fraud on the national airways have appeared outwardly to be paragons of the Christian faith. They certainly have said the right religious buzzwords. They've dressed as members of the blessed. They certainly have spoken the language of religion. 
But this has given rise to a vicious cynicism of all Christian evangelicals, which I think, and I go on record today, that this is very unfair. That as people of Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I have a ministry to be those evangelists and, and not be tarred and feathered uh, by those that have misrepresented the faith. The word evangelist comes from the Greek word evangelos, which means bearer of good news. There's a takeaway for the sermon this morning. What, what does evangelism mean? It comes from evangelos, means bearer of good news. And I suggest you and I and everybody you know has the capacity to be a bearer of good news. In fact, I think we are called to be bearers of good news. So let us reflect on bearing good news of the Gospels by remembering Christ's foundation for evangelism. The early church is very much remembered by Matthew's recollection of Jesus' ministries, particularly that day on that Galilean hillside, where he gathered his disciples and all his followers, and he shared with them the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is very much the textbook in terms of bringing people to convert to our faith and understanding the values of our faith. In the first five sets of the teaching in this gospel, Jesus addresses his potential followers as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Interesting, eh? Jesus always got it to us. He made it understandable. He communicated well. That's why he told parables, because people remember stories. But he's asking these people on that hillside, look, I've got a calling for you. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and you people understand salt and light. It's a common human experience, analogy that you understand. But then he says to his listeners, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? He doesn't wait for an answer from the crowd. He says, whoa, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown on the ground and trampled by people. Food has been preserved primarily by salt in every era prior to our own. The Christian in Jesus' analogy is one who seeks to preserve the world for the sake of God, not the, the church for the sake of the world. There's a deliverable as well. We are not called to be evangelists uh, to save the church from the world. We are called to be evangelists today to save the world for the sake of God. In other words, Jesus is not saying to you and I, oh, we better get into that fetal position of self-preservation and, and we'll just kind of cocoon and we're okay. We're not okay. Jesus this morning is calling you and I to take a risk of discipleship. He's asking you and I to be those bearers of good news. The twin metaphors of salt and light perhaps disturb, disturb some of us in this season when the concept of evangelism has fallen upon hard times. A few of us, if I ask any of you, you know, you know what, Sean, we've got a new ministry, you're the new guy here, so, so what we're going to do, we're going to print up a whole bunch of brochures to the five steps of salvation, and we're going to get everybody listening today to knock on doors and leave brochures at that door. <laughs> Somebody said, whoa, I'm not prepared to do that. that, that's not what I have in mind when you talk about evangelism, Jerry. Remember the man that said his father had a warped sense of humor? He said, yeah, my dad had a warped sense of humor. On Halloween, he would dress me up as a Jehovah Witness, and nobody would answer their doors. That's the society we live in, all right? And I might suggest to you, if you ask complete strangers, all right, complete strangers that are on their way to Tim Hortons this morning, uh, do you have eternity guaranteed in terms of your salvation? And if you said, Jerry, that's what I want you to do, to be an evangelist, you say, whoa, I'm snuffing that candle. I'm going to put my head under that basket. I, I don't want to be an evangelist that is kind of repulsive and confronting and intimidating. But, but that's not what Jesus wants. If you're comfortable asking people about their salvation, God bless you, you've got a ministry. If you're comfortable, in fact, knocking on people's doors and saying, hey, it's 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Have you tuned in to KFM? Are you watching All Nations? There's nothing wrong with that. But it is not confrontational. It isn't being a bully. I might suggest to you today that in Jesus' text of Matthew, I got the feeling he wanted everybody on that hillside. All his disciples are being called to be evangelists everybody's being asked to do something. You're sitting there on that hillside. Here's the Son of God talking to you. 
He's making it really clear about salt and light. And you're going to leave that hillside and do what? All right, that, that's the question. Do what? How about Peter? Peter was the first to affirm Jesus and the first to deny Jesus. All right? And what does he become? Likely the best evangelist after Jesus. All right? How about the women in Jesus' entourage? A lot of them had warts and flaws and problems. In fact, in that patriarchal society, those women could not testify in the court of law because their voices were mute. Thank goodness we have progressed and enlightened ourselves about everybody's voice. But back then, that's said, Why do I tell you that? Hey, friends, think about this for just a minute. It was Mary Magdalene and Salome and those other women who, in fact, found the tomb empty. They are the voices of resurrection. The tomb is empty. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That's the good news from those voices. So I suggest to you today that Jesus is asking all of us, willing or unwilling, to become ambassadors of the good news. Now, I want to make some qualifications on that. Evangelism has nothing to do with slick, commercialized gimmicks or pressurized forms of guilt manipulation. All right? It's right here. It's what's in your heart and your soul that you're prepared to share that good news. I'm old and decrepit. I am so old, I remember when Glad Tidings was on Alder Street. It had a small church on Alder Street, and I'm not sure if Pastor Candelon or who was the pastor at the time, but every September or October, Glad Tidings would have a kitty crusade. It was interesting this morning, maybe the Lord's kind of inspiring me to tell this story, Sean, because you're talking about Rock City Kids. So Kitty Crusade was when all the kids got back to school, and it started on a Monday. And they would put little brochures in the West End, and they would tell everybody, come to Glad Tidings after school. Back then, we had to go to school at 4 o'clock. <laughs> when it was winter, you were almost going home in the dark. But anyway, having said that, it was 4 o'clock, you went to Glad Tidings on a Monday. And you know what was on the platform that Monday? A brand new CCM bicycle from Canadian Tire. In fact, I even remember it had those little ribbons hanging off the end of it, all right? It was pretty classy, all right? Brand new bicycle. And there was the pastor of Glad Tidings at the front, and we're having Kitty Crusade. And then at the Kitty Crusade, the pastor would say, and by the way, whoever brings the most friends by the end of the week will get this bicycle, all right? Well, I got to tell you, Tuesday, there was a lot more people there. By Wednesday, there was a lot more people there. And I got to tell you something, Mike. By Friday, there were more French Catholic kids in that Pentecostal church than you've ever seen in your life, all right? Because we weren't listening for the word. We, we weren't talking about what the pastor was. We were just looking at that bicycle. <laughs> Who's going to get that bike? And we got to go up to St. Albert's School because we were going to King George Public School at that time. And we had to say to the kids at St. Albert's, come on down. And you know what? I'll let you ride the bike someday. So, so we're working on a bike and evangelism. No, it's wrong. The fact of the matter is Jesus very much intended everyone to be an evangelist with the gift of God's forgiving and redeeming love. And it's available to all of us. We don't need a bike. We just need to be able to be sincere and genuine. Our times may be similar to the optimistic period in Israel's history, when King Kabias of Persia presided over the return of the exiled people into Judah. The humiliation of a slavery had ended. And through the construction of the temple in Jerusalem, there was an opportunity now for the Israeli people, the chosen people, to be able to worship God, Yahweh, in freedom. A whole liturgy of remembrance. If you're not comfortable with the word liturgy, just think about our worship team, all right? It's what you do to kind of get in the mood, to be able to understand, to be in God's house. So they called it liturgy, we call it worship team, but it's that light, that praise, that prayer, well, these chosen people, in fact, developed a whole liturgy of remembrance, fasting. They fasted, was practiced in order to dramatize the memory of the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem. I've got a fast, all right? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, they also had a fast to recall the capture of Jerusalem. Well, if that isn't enough, guess what? Another fast. They had another fast about the burning of Jerusalem, and we're not done yet. No way. We've got a fourth fast to commemorate the death of Judah's king. These were pious rituals to express the gamut of human emotions 
mourning, repentance, self-mortification, uh, self-denial. Why do I tell you all that? Well, if you want to do some Bible study today, uh, go to the book of Isaiah, because Isaiah's got some real opinions about all that fasting. In fact, he challenges the sincerity of that piety. Isaiah's voice thunders in response, Behold, you fast only to quarrel and fight among yourselves. Your fasting this day will not be heard in heaven. Is this not the fast I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. The prophet is addressing a very pious people who created a very elaborate religious enterprise. But he stated, if you want to fast, if you want your voice heard in heaven, what do you need to do? Well, Isaiah said, to be faithful, you must share your bread with the hungry. You must bring the homeless into your house. You must clothe the naked. Doesn't that sound familiar to Matthew 25, verse 31? But this is Isaiah 58, verse 7. This is the Old Testament that Isaiah is telling his fellow church members, his fellow temple members, quit with all that fasting of pretense and start fasting with sincerity of ministry. Evangelism, biblically understood, has to do with the salvation of souls and the liberation of the oppressed. It is both personal and it is social. It informs our worship, but it also defines our mission. Evangelism, interesting, Sean, you talk about the 10 balloons. Evangelism, evangelism has to do in prayer after service that someone decides that they're going to give them their lives to Jesus. That, that's, that's evangelism, all right? But evangelism is also wiping the tear from a grandchild whose parents announced last week they're going to have a divorce. That's evangelism. That's being there. That's bringing light to darkness. Evangelism is breaking the bread of communion. And Mike Tullock is going to do that momentarily. And as I told you, every time I get to this platform, I really think the reason we're all here is because of that wine and bread, that grape juice and bread, uh, the communion with Jesus. And what is Mike going to say? His body broken for us. But it's also <laughs> filling a bag of groceries and having prayer with a family that has come in need of food. This bread, that bread. <laughs> See evangelism? See bearer of good news? Remember my bread sermons that I quoted to you the definition of evangelism by that great preacher, Dr. D.T. Niles, who said evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find the bread. I suggest to you today that all nations church evangelism and ministry will be strong if we do three things one is that we need to be an inviting church we need to show hospitality to strangers everyone that is listening to us today has at least one friend one relative one neighbor who does not have a church family that does not understand the light of faith but I might suggest that friend in the community that you need to invite to be a friend in this communion. Pretty obvious, isn't it? If I was your special friend and I had a rare disease, and in fact, you had the medicine to cure me of that disease, wouldn't you come to me as your friend and say, Jerry, I've got, I got the medicine. If you take this medicine, you're going to be cured of that sickness, of that illness, of that disease. I suggest to you this morning that you and I have the cure. <laughs> we know the cure. We're, we're in the God's house of the cure. This is the best pharmacy in the world, all right? Th this place heals because Jesus healed. And he can heal spirit, and he can heal mind, and he can heal body. But you need to invite people to share in this church family. And as much as COVID is challenging, as much as COVID can certainly create barriers, I don't know about you, but I love coming to this church and meeting people at that front door that give you a good smile and handshake. I, I love the fact after church, you can kind of, everybody shakes hands and hugs. We, we can't do that with COVID. But you know what COVID really makes easy? Our evangelism. <laughs> really easy. Okay, all you got to do is phone up somebody that's not listening today and say, hey, you know what? 
tune in tomorrow at the website of the church. You're going to hear about bearer of good news. Guess what? I got some medicine I want you to have. Listen to that sermon, all right? And better yet, you can prep them for next Sunday. Say, look, I know you're, I know you're not a church person, all right? I, hey, I know that. And I don't want to be offensive, all right? I'm not going to ask you if your brakes fail or you're going to go to heaven. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say to you that I get a lot out of all nations church family. And if you join, you, you might hear some really good music, all right, that's going to inspire you. Good news. You might hear a message that is a little different than the messages you've decided you don't want to hear anymore uh, to enlighten and to empower you. And the worst is, after 20 minutes, if you don't like it, turn off your radio. All right? There, there it is, man. That, that's all you have to do. A and then I might suggest to you uh, that you can encourage them to be part of the fellowship and the ministries of this church. Without COVID, I would challenge all of you Hopefully, Lord, it's June 2nd that we're going to be able to get ourselves back into a little bit more interaction. But, you know, those life groups are magnificent because there's a fellowship among small people. Large groups, sometimes we're not comfortable. Small groups, we are. So I'd ask you, if you're going to be an evangelist this summer, that you're going to invite somebody for lunch or dinner and just tell them why you come to All Nations. That's it. Okay, just tell them, hey, I just wanted to let you know, uh, you're my friend, we golf together, we hang out in the food court at the New Sudbury Shopping Center together, we, we, but I never told you why on a Sunday morning I go to all I just want to tell you that, and you're going to get some good food because we're good cooks in this house, all right? Secondly, we can need to be a church of volunteers. We shall not be satisfied until every member of all nations' church has volunteered to do something. Why is that important to our evangelism? What's the greatest commandment? Love God, heart, soul, and strength. What's the second greatest commandment? Love your neighbor. And how do you love your neighbor? Is by, in fact, volunteering to bring light and to bring support, to bring comfort, to bring food, to bring clothes, to bring a hug, to bring a listening ear. There's lots of ways you can volunteer to love your neighbor. Harry Emerson Fosdick in his autobiography, gave an account of his congregation's last service before moving into their brand new church. He startled his congregation with the following words. My friends, it's not settled yet whether our new church will be wonderful. That depends on what we do in it and with it. If we should gather a selfish company there while the walls bulge every Sunday, that would not be wonderful. If we form a religious club there, enjoying ourselves, <laughs> that would not be wonderful. If in this city where so many live, we can lift up some burdens and lighten some dark spots and help solve problems, that would be wonderful. If in that new church we simply sit in the heavenly, that would not be wonderful. But if we work together in the unheavenly places, that would be. That's the challenge. And it's a challenge that I know this church has heard in the past. Catherine Irwin Sagan, I'm sure you're listening. God bless you. You're my poster child for this service today. You heard about getting out of the boat. <laughs> you heard about St. James in the Valley baking 400 cookies. A and then you responded by gathering up a cookie ministry team of in excess of 18 people, I'm told, and you're baking cookies. Uh, to feed the hungry people. And in fact, last Sunday I preached at St. James in the Valley and they were so pleased to hear the synergy between the two churches and they were going to want, can we get a few more churches? Talk to your mother, all right? See if your mom's church wants to bake some cookies, all right? Understand uh, that that's the ministry of good news. Mike Tulloch. Mike's a great guy. He's one of my heroes in terms of the Christian journey. And I don't say that to embarrass him or patronize him today. Uh, but this week at the mission in June on the four Saturdays, we're going to give those folks a barbecue. All right? We're going to have, instead of them getting the takeout out the window, instead of getting sandwiches or whatever, we're going to have a full-fledged barbecue and the CP rail yard across the street. Social distancing, masks, we understand all of that. But we just thought that's a great way to bring light Good news to some folks that don't really get a barbecue because where they live, they sure don't have barbecue grills, I can tell you that, all right? So I called Mike. I said, Mike, four Saturdays, all right? 
It's uh, 200 hamburgers a Saturday, 200 sausages. It's going to be about 800 likely pounds of meat. And you know what Mike Tullock said without any hesitation? Uh, no problem. And by the way, when we had the barbecue at the plunge, you got to pre-cook those meat, and I can do that for you too. So, so not only is he given meat, he's going to cook the meat so nobody gets sick, and then we're going to give the meat out on a Saturday because we understand that's evangelism about bearing good news to help other people. You put a hockey sweater on last Sunday, I think it was, because it was a good draft pick, all right? Number one, can't get better than that, right, Sean? Now, yeah, well, the guy's name's Dario Zulich. He goes to this church, and Dario Zulich has got a rusting water tower that I'm 66 years old, and I can't remember it not being in our community. He's going to dedicate a peace garden to our buddy Jeremy, but, but he's going to make social housing so that people have a decent place to live. That's volunteering. That's bringing light. That's the bear of good news. Thirdly, we shall be a loving church. A truly evangelical church does not need to advertise the notion that they are a Christ-centered church. <laughs> Come on, all right? What's the song, Sarah? They will tell that we are Christians by our love, all right? 1960s, you weren't even born, all right? I was singing that song in Sunday school, all right? They will tell we are Christians by our love. You don't need to advertise it. You don't need a billboard about it. They will tell we are Christians by our love, by the fact we do loving things. And if we're not doing loving things, let's not leave that Galilean hillside of Sermon on the Mount with any darkness in our hearts, that you and I are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that as brothers and sisters in Christ, we love one another. And it's not sibling rivalry about getting one upmanship or putting people in their place or dismissing or marginalizing. That's not loving one another. Loving one another is the ability to always share light. And even if there's differences, uh, that we're able to overcome the differences and continue to share light. If you get nothing out of the sermon, all right, we're, oh my goodness, it's 10.53 and we still got to do communion and sing a song. Sean, you said it was going to be an hour long. Looks like Lockheed's on a roll. It's not going to be an hour long, all right? But no, no, I, I want you to go away with something. Don't, don't forget, in my real life, I'm an undertaker, all right? Uh, 47 years being an undertaker. And I can't begin to tell you the many times in my office that bereaved people with a husband that died of a heart attack, a wife with breast cancer, a child in a car accident, that people have looked on the other side of my desk and said, you know, Jerry, if I could do one thing, I'd like to tell him or her that I'd love them one more time. But dead people have deaf ears, and that's so frustrating and so hurting. But guess what? You don't have deaf ears, or you wouldn't be listening to this service right now, all right? You've got living, loving ears. And if there's nothing else in this sermon you're going to take away from this sermon, I want you to be committed before you put your head on your pillow tonight that you tell somebody that you love them. That you tell them that you love them and you mean that with a sincerity that's not a piety, not something commercialized, not manipulation, that you truly love them. And if some people are hard to love, then you're going to ask the good Lord, Lord, I want to be an evangelist. I want to be the bearer of good news. Help me get more light uh, that I can say I love you. And that I want you to do. Anything else is great, but I want to make sure you tell somebody you love them today. I close with a story I love. <laughs> it's a story that comes from Reader's Digest because most pastor stories come from Reader's Digest, Sean, and this is one of those stories. I actually shared it at one of my relatives' funerals, a lady that taught Sunday school and she looked after a lot of good relatives. But the story goes a little bit like this. There was a little boy who wanted to meet God. He decided it was a long trip to where God lived, so he packed himself a suitcase with Twinkies and a six-pack of root beer, started on his journey. When he got about three blocks, he saw an elderly woman sitting on a park bench. The boy sat down next to her, opened up his suitcase. He was about to take a drink from his root beer when he noticed he thought that woman looked a bit hungry. So he offered her a Twinkie. And she gratefully accepted that Twinkie, and she smiled at him. Her smile was so pretty that the boy wanted to see it again. So he offered her a root beer. <laughs> Once again, she smiled, and the boy, he was delighted. They sat there all afternoon, eating and smiling, but they never said a word. 
As it grew dark, the boy realized how tired he was and he had time to go home. But before he'd gone more than a few steps, he turned around and he ran back to that elderly woman and he gave her a really, really big hug and she gave him the biggest smile ever. When the boy got home and opened the door, his mother looked at him and said, my goodness, you look so very happy and joyous. What did you do today that made you so happy? And the little boy said, I had lunch with God. (laughs) But before his mother could say anything, the little boy said, you know what, Mom? She's got the most beautiful smile I've ever seen. Meanwhile, the elderly woman, also radiant with joy, returned to her home where she lived with her son. The son was stunned to see his mother so happy because it's been many days before that she was like that. So he said to his mom, Mom, what did you do today that made you so happy? And she replied, I ate Twinkies in the park with God. (laughs) But before her son could respond, she said, you know, he's much younger than I thought he was. Today, with our love, our commitment, and our good news to others, let us invite God for lunch, because guess what, friends? He's always in our bubble. And that we may eat the bread of life and share in the smile of salvation. And everybody says, Amen.